Okay, three, two, one. This is Wikipedia Weekly, episode 109 for February 5th, 2014. Systemic bias in Wikipedia. Welcome to another episode of Wikipedia Weekly. I'm your host, Andrew Lee, also known as User Fuzz Hedo in the English Wikipedia. I'm Kevin Gorman, surprisingly also known as user Kevin Gorman in the English Wikipedia, and as a very uncreative name-wise person. I'm Tom, also known as user Galliero on the English Wikipedia. I'm Jonathan, also known as user We're Spill Checkers on the English Wikipedia, and on a few other projects as well, mainly comments. Great, so welcome back to Wikipedia Weekly. Our last episode was last month in January, so it's been a few weeks since we've had discussions around Wikipedia. But uh, in the meantime, we had a lot of interesting news that's uh, come around. One of the uh, ones that's made some headlines is the fact that Wikipedia has come back into the news. Um, whether you th characterize it as swinging back or pushing back on the fact that the Wikimedia Foundation has served them um, legal notice, uh, there are reports that Wikipedia is, you know, saying they've been vilified in the media, and looks like their story is a little bit different than what we originally thought. So, Kevin, you've been following this for a while. Um, you were actually quite central to a lot of the sleuthing around Wikipedia. Tell us a little bit about where Wikipedia is now in the media and and what their latest statement has been like. So I feel like before I start talking, I should disclose that I'm both the person who originally got them community banned. I'm the person who placed one of the early stories about them. So this take on Wikipedia is not necessarily a completely <laughs> unbiased take. Uh, however, looking at Business Insider's recent interview with uh, Jordan French or Michael French, I don't know what he, they labeled him as, but he's the same person. Uh, I have a hard time not just laughing. Uh, to scroll down a bit into the interview, uh, Jordan French is trying to describe what Wikipedia does. And Jordan's reply to what, what do you do, basically, is, well, we start with legally actionable libel. People call us. They're upset. They're crying. They're typically people with a lot of money. They're one hair trigger away from suing the Wikimedia Foundation. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, so one of the interesting things about this to me is, first, it does not match up with what they actually do. And second, the Wikimedia Foundation enjoys, uh, thanks to Section 230 of the Community, Section, uh, Community Decency Act, basically widespread immunity from being sued from things that are on Wikipedia. Uh, so that's an obvious initial error. They're not one, one step away from suing the Wikimedia Foundation because they can't really sue the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, but after the initial article came out, I decided to, since I am somehow an administrator now, uh, to resurrect some of Wikipedia's past work, uh, which I think puts to rest any idea that Wikipedia primarily deals with libel. Uh, before I talk a little bit about one of the articles they wrote called Casino.org, uh, I just want to point out that it's really, really funny to me that they had a client called All Women's Talk, and the wiki PR writer who put the piece together uh, made some error with capitalization through the entire article. So instead of reading as All Women's Talk, it reads as all women stock. <laughs> and when you're charging somebody thousands and thousands of dollars for what you're doing, I think that there's a kind of big difference that you should notice between the idea of all women's talk and all women stock. <laughs> they kind of mean significantly different things when you talk about it. Uh, if you're curious about looking at some of these examples, I've preserved them all in my user space. Uh, I've resurrected them and protected them and no-indexed them, so they're not going to end up on a search engine or anything, so I don't think that 
there is much harm from preserving some aspects of their work. Uh, now, now, so this this Business Insider piece that you pointed to was kind of a Q&A or an interview with Jordan French um, trying to get their side of the story. And I think, as you said, one of the things that Wikipedia was trying to portray themselves as was kind of a white knight saying that firms were quite frustrated with the state of their articles and um, Wikipedia was trying to help them uh, fix what is, I think, even if you were to to look at this objectively, what can be a pretty frustrating thing for companies who don't really mm -hmm. know what they're doing in Wikipedia. But I thought that was, as you point out, kind of an unfair characterization because the investigation into what Wikipedia had done was far beyond helping companies that had existing problems with articles, right? It was a big problem with the company actually manufacturing fake news items or appearing to be legit news items to support brand new article creation in Wikipedia, right? One of the more interesting things about the entire thing, uh, Jordan French has admitted definitely to doing this in a phone call with me, and I may have a written record of it still through email, uh, but the site is vitalist.org as well as Investment Underground and several other sites that they regularly use as citations are not news sites. They were sites that Wikipedia came up with with the explicit goal of kind of bolstering the notability of uh, the people that they're writing about. And I'm not a complete opponent of paid editing, but when you're literally creating your own network of news sites <laughs> to write about your clients, that kind of passes a major line. Uh, Vatalis has sensed that the domain has lapsed. Uh, once Wikipedia figured out that we were tracking what articles they were writing, through doing things like searching for new articles that use Vatalist as a site or as a source, uh, they stopped using it. Although they still they switched to other devious tactics after that initial blow. Uh, but the common Vatalist site is also why I know that all of the Wikipedia articles that I have resurrected are actually done by Wikipedia. Uh, I would encourage people to take a brief glance as they have time at the casino.org article that I resurrected. Uh, it's directly linked from my user page, so it should be fit. Well, the general Wikipedia articles that I've resurrected are linked from my user page, and casino.org is one click away from there. Where the casino.org article uh, makes a variety of really impressive claims about Casino.org, including it's been recognized by Wired, it's been recognized by CNN, it's been recognized by the Wall Street Journal, it's been recognized by PBS, while sourcing them to these completely, uh, if you go to the top, uh, the second big paragraph, or the first big paragraph before the end of my introduction. If you click on here, uh, you'll come up with the Wikipedia stuff. But anyway, so all of those claims are sourced to sources that they made up. If you actually look for a mention of casino.org on CNN or CNN archives, you will find one passing mention of casino.org, and that's in the context of an article about marijuana. Uh, simply because one of the founders of Casino.org later went into the medical marijuana market. Right. And that definitely does not... That's at complete odds with everything they say they do and I think demonstrates that they don't belong on Wikipedia. Well, I encourage folks to take a look at the signpost article that was put up that was very detailed about this. And something that, correct me if I'm wrong, which I think is new to the public, is the fact that in here, um, the article that was written by Ed17 talks about a document that was proposed by a Wikipedian that tried to mediate between uh, Wikipedia in the community to say, hey, you know, here are some things that you could do Wikipedia now um, that this case has blown up to try to make amends. 
and there were some things that apparently Wikipedia had agreed to do or suggested the document was correct on, but the Business Insider interview, um, <laughs> I guess, uh, interview was contrary to what Wikipedia had actually stated in this document. So it gets a little bit complex, but I recommend folks to go watch uh, the Signpost article's uh, activity and discussion. It's quite interesting to see some of the, uh, the uh, information there. Uh, one the Sorry, one of the things I find interesting ab about this one is their, um, their, their claim beginning of this that, um, that they're primarily about, um, uh, about dealing with, with, with libel and, and the sort of stuff that we'd all want to, to get rid of. Now, one of the drawbacks of, of a claim like that is that you can't substantiate it on wiki because you'd be linking to a bunch of things that we don't want people to be linking to. Um, so if if that claim is legit, if they want to substantiate that claim, um, I would suggest that they send a bunch of links to to Arbcom um, or to a neutral, no, to, to Arbcom rather than a neutral admin. Um, and no, that that's a that you you may find that there's a certain lack of evidence for that claim, but it's I think the whole community would turn around and say if there is genuine libel, is stuff that really ought to come out of an article, then we're not that fussed if the people who are taking it out are 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 paid to do so on there. Um, and another thing that they 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 could be doing. Um, and other PR people could be doing is saying, well, if there's if there's no image of if there's an article on one of our clients and there's no image there or not a particularly flattering image or frankly we can give you a far better image, upload a better image on Commons, and that's one of the things that we should be saying to them. However, I've been involved in a couple of conversations with um, with PR people. And um, I wouldn't necessarily make it a priority on my time in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so I should say at this point that uh, both myself and the Wikipedian who drafted the document referenced in the signpost have repeatedly reached out to Wikipedia requesting better examples of their work, requesting things like, uh, if you're removing libel, please tell us where this libel is. Or oh, if you can't tell us where this libel is, please tell ARBCOM or another body that you trust. I've gone as far as to guarantee, uh, because G5, which is the deletion, the, the CSD for uh, evidence by a banned, or articles by a banned user, uh, only applies if there have been no significant improvements on the article since the time of the banned user editing it. I've gone as far as to offer to them that if they want to provide me examples of these, and I agree that they're removing libel, that I will then go ahead and substantially improve the articles they're working on, so that there's no chance that they could be D5 or G5 or otherwise deleted. And so far, despite the fact that I receive emails from Jordan French generally about once a week. Once a week. I actually got another one today. Uh, whenever I email him back going, I would really, really, really like to present both sides of the case. Can you give me anything here? Like, can you show me something that you've done that doesn't make you look like an asshole? And he hasn't, and with the other Wikipedians who have been talking to Wikipr, he has similarly refused to divulge any information that makes it look like what they primarily do is actually remove libel. If I was able to be convinced that Wikipr primarily removed libel, I would be at the administrator's notice board tomorrow with a few caveats suggesting that it might be a good idea to unban them. But so far, that's something that they've proven categorically unwilling to provide if it exists. Yeah. So well, let's see what happens with this. Um, it's uh, kind of unfortunate the way things have gone, but I don't see any resolution coming anytime soon on this one. But it's uh, interesting to see 
if the, they're going to come back and, and respond to respond to the document and I don't know, but it, it shows kind of a uh, a conflict of in, in whether Wikipedia is serious about trying to get rehabbed in the community. Um, so we'll see. Okay. Um, let's turn to the other topic, which was kind of a cool project that got a lot of press this week, which is the Wiki VIP project. So I'm wondering if you folks have heard of it. Um, this, I'm really surprised and pleasantly surprised how much the mainstream media has picked up on the story. So um, I think, Jonathan, you may know more than we do because this is actually kind of a UK... Uh, oh, is this the BBC thing? Well, this the, is the, the, voice, the Voices the, one, that's the right. So it was Andy Mabbitt yeah. who, funny, funny thing is that he's been harassing me for months <laughs> before this thing came out, saying, could you record your voice, could you record your voice, because I, I actually have a Wikipedia article about myself, and he's been saying, you know, I want to try to get this project off the ground, and could you record your voice, and I, I'm sad to say, we, I, I never really we responded. Actually had, um, we had two editor-thons in, in London that day, and um, I wound up at the one at London Zoo because um, they needed some spare laptops and and a and, and mobile Wi-Fi from the office. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't at the BBC one. I did join um, the I did join them in the pub afterwards, and um, uh, there was quite a proportion of of quite a quite an enthusiastic crowd, including um, quite a few people that I I'd not met before. Um, and were mostly were, were new to editing and so on. Um, so there's there's been quite a buzz on that. But um, for for those listening who are not aware of what we're talking about, um, uh, the the BBC has has very kindly released a number of clips from its sound ar sound archives of um, various um, famous people speaking. Um, Stephen Fry being a, a classic example, um, and. Uh, there was an editathon a few weeks back where those were being those clips were being added to articles and I think were being converted and, and loaded up, um, and um, uh, where it's it's made a lot of publicity. Um, Stephen Fry tweeted about the the thing, which um, um, was we were very grateful for because um, somebody gave us two hundred and fifty quid because um, he he linked to the uh, Wikimedia UK website um, and. Um, the, one of the things that's highlighted to me is that if you look at, at Wikipedia articles, the proportion where we've got any sort of multimedia, whether a, a, a video clip or a bit of sound or the, or the, the two together, is is really small. And there are there are some articles where that won't make much of a difference, or there's very little chance of getting a recording of somebody from more than sort of 120 years ago. Um, but there are a lot of articles where you think, if if we've got an article on this windmill, why haven't we got a bit of video of the the sails going round on the windmill and and the machinery going round on the inside and and things like that? And that's that's the sort of direction which I think we'll see Commons going in over the next few years because the 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 technology to to take little bits of video. Is now quite widespread, and we may wind up with some fairly fairly low quality stuff. Mm -hmm. at, at first. Um, combined, of course, with organisations like the BBC saying, "Well, actually, we can get some some wonderful publicity, releasing some stuff that is of 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 very little value to them otherwise." And they 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 by sharing that information with us, they're not they're not losing anything. In fact, they're gaining. A lot of publicity, right? So um, I, I think we'll we'll see more of this in the future. I'm very, um, it's a very positive move. Yeah, I think it's you great, and it's actually like a, it is a glam like engagement. Even though the BBC is not technically a gallery, library, archive, or museum, glam it's, has uh, always been about more than just those folks, right? So as as the um, as Wikimedia UK's glam organizer, I'm more than happy to um, to grab anyone as an archive who's got an archive. That includes the BBC. Right. That's so great. We, we can be quite flexible at times as to as to what a glam is, and um, where somebody even came up with a, came up with the phrase "glams" to include um, to include zoos after our London Zoo editor yeah. on. Zoos, um, and then we did wind up in their library there. Right, right. 
And um, one of the things that that, that, that resulted in actually is that, um, and, a, and a couple of other visits, is that if you look at the the Wikimania page, uh, the Wikimania 2014 stuff, there is now a whole page on specialist libraries in London that are um, uh, available for um, people to visit and and users reference things. Right. So we could have some interesting things going on, particularly as part of the fringe of Wikimania. No. But that's a bit of a slight digression. Right. Well, I think that's great, and be it'd be great to see that inspire more voices projects. And I think the duration was, what, 40 seconds or something like that, that the BBC has released of all these different celebrity or well-known voices. And um, that's pretty... That's pretty cool to, to see that happen. So hopefully that will inspire more folks to add, you know, use little sound clips to Wikipedia. Aren't each of these episodes under the Creative Commons license? Uh, these? Or the audio stripped out? On... Uh, that's that's uh, pretty much what we've been doing over the years, yeah. So technically, if anybody wanted to get your voice, all they would need to do is go to one episode, cut out 40 seconds... Right. And upload it to Commons. Well, that's that's one reason why when Andy Mabbitt was was hounding me, I'm like, could you just take an episode of Wikipedia Weekly and just clip something of mine out? <laughs> I should have done it honestly. I mean, I, I was kind of lazy in that sense. But um, but but Jonathan, what you mentioned is a really good segue into something that has happened since our last recording, which is the referendum or the RFC on video in Wikipedia. So what you say is true or should be true. Like we all now have mobile phones, we've got you know great quality video recording devices in our hands, but it's actually been really hard to contribute video to Wikipedia because we're so um, pedantic about using open standards for video to upload. So there really is no easy way to either upload video or even to watch the two standards that we have in Commons um, to watch any video on an iPhone or on an iPad. So. Um, in the time between the last episode and this episode, there was an RFC opened on Commons that was initiated by the multimedia team of the Wikimedia Foundation, which was a pretty bold proposal on um, asking the community whether we should be supporting the MP4 format for video, which should be, I don't want to say a no-brainer, but because there's no, no such thing in Wikipedia, everyone can argue everything <laughs> at any time to length, but um, if you know what this, if you know what people use and how dominant MP4 is, um, it probably would make sense to an average consumer that we would use MP4 in some way, but we actually don't, and the community voted pretty strongly not to use any form of the MP4 video format in Commons, which was quite a big blow to the efforts of the multimedia team. So uh, I know, Kevin, you are quite knowledgeable about that. I don't know, Jonathan, whether you knew anything about um, that RFC, but yeah. I was involved um, with that somewhat <clears throat> in crafting the RFC, not that I had any confidence it would go through, but because I've been trying to encourage more video production with Wikipedia, I knew it would be a hard thing to pass, and it didn't pass. So I wonder if you folks had any uh, opinions about that MP4 RFC that was there. I wouldn't call it pedantic, <laughs> because I don't see um, the current license for MP4 to be compatible with the Creative Commons license if you can't use anything that you create under the M in the MP4 for in the MP4 format for um, commercial uses. So how can you claim that the file is for commercial use if you can't use it in that format for commercial use? Well, I think there's a very easy answer to that. Uh, I think that the main reason that the RFC bombed, and I was active in providing Fabrice Florin, who's the head of the Wikimedia Foundation's multi-team, or multimedia team, with advice about how to construct it beforehand, most of which was kind of unfortunately not followed. Uh, but the plan to put MP4 on Commons was not that we would have videos that would only be in MP4. It was that if a user edited a MP4 or had a browser that was only accessible, uh, could only play MP4 videos, then the MP4 video would be uploaded, but at the same time it would be transcoded into the two open formats that we currently host. 
So people would have the choice of downloading all three of the formats. And although MP4 is technically patent encumbered, uh, users would still have the choice of downloading any of the two fully free formats of the exact same video, where you can kind of get into semantics and argue, is an MP4 version of a video really the exact same thing as an AUG version of the video? But I think that it would have been in the interests of the Wikimedia movement for the entire proposal to pass. And I think that uh, it would have greatly increased the availability of videos to Wikimedia Commons without representing any meaningful comment or any meaningful compromise to our own values, simply because uh, we would have been transcoding it into two other free formats at the exact same time. Right. I, th I think, uh, but Tom, what you said, I think, has some validity in terms of even perception within the community, which is that the license is kind of confusing. And for folks who don't really know, the, the whole idea of these MPEG video patents, um, they are held by a group called MPEG LA, or the Licensing Agreement group, and it's a bunch of patent holders who've kind of joined forces and said, oh, we all kind of hold tiny little patents that cover this. Why don't we put our eggs in one basket, and then we can have a central licensing authority. And the problem is that it is quite confusing whether you're streaming video for free on the internet versus burning it to DVD versus, you know, using some other distribution method, and it was sufficiently confusing enough, and as Kevin kind of alluded to, maybe the groundwork was not laid out quite as solidly as it could have been when it RFC launched. That the community kind of looked at it and said, "This is this is really dubious, and we don't think it passes the sniff test in terms of being compatible with Creative Commons." Even though I think, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, like a week later, the legal team came in with some clarification saying, "No, no, 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 guys, it's actually fine." But by that point, the RFC was kind of blown, and there was no way to recover. But I there's it wasn't a wasn't an issue so much. At, sorry, I, th I thought it wasn't so much an issue of Creative Commons as whether the um, whether the software itself was was licensed. So there's the, there's the end result from it, mm -hmm. um, but there's also um, that that there are certain we are to to some people and to some extent we are a, a part of the 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 free software movement. And to some people that's a really important part of what they're up to, and to other people it's an irrelevance. And I think that was part of the divide we saw in that RFC, and what I've, I've seen in a couple of other arguments as well. Um, I'm, I'm not enormous, that's not enormously my battleground, but I can see the, 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 the arguments on, on one side of that. And where we have made a compromise in the other direction with, with um, Wikipedia, where we've we've got this um, fair, the whole fair use exemption, um, I, I, can, I keep seeing that causing problems and confusions and so on. So I can understand why some people are being quite purist on this. Also, there is a difference between we've read the licensing agreement and we think that it's okay and well my friend's lawyer read it and they think it's okay so we should take their word for it because the community was never given access to the license agreement and it was supposed to be kept secret what's exactly in there right. even if the lawyers at the Wikimedia Foundation say it, it's, it'll be legal for us that doesn't mean that it's open source software Right. It's we, certainly we, not open source software. Uh, it's absolutely not open source software. But I think that when we have the choice of slightly adopting software that is not open source and having 500,000 videos or 5 million videos instead of not doing the same and only having 50,000 videos that cannot play in Internet Explorer out of the box in Windows 7, while at the same time ensuring that we're transcoding those videos so that anyone who does want to use them for a particular purpose uh, will be able to do so freely, I think it really is kind of a no-brainer. 
and I think that unfortunately there were a significant number of mistakes in the initial RFC. For instance, the legal opinion of the Wikimedia Foundation should have been included in the initial RFC. And I feel generally like the RFC was written more for engineers than for Wikimedia. Uh, but I think that without those mistakes, there is a probably 80% chance that the RFC would have passed. You're more optimistic than I am, Kevin. I was, I was always like... There's a 40% chance on a good day this is going to pass just because of the things that, that Tom said is that you had to really hold your nose at a lot of the stuff that they were putting out there. Uh, one of the things was that um, if the if Wikimedia Foundation got a license specially for this from MPEG LA, they could not make those terms public. That just does not fly with this community in terms of saying, trust us, the Foundation's got it, the Foundation's got you covered, don't worry, you don't have to see it. That just is not going to swing it. You know. Definitely doesn't easily fly, but from talking to Fabrice and from talking to other people, my understanding is that the license that we got would have either been for free or for absolutely minimal cost. Right, right. And in a but... scenario where a free or minimal cost license allows us to have 10 or 15 or 100 times more videos than we do currently, while absolutely preserving the freedom to reuse those videos, uh, either through, well, generally through using, because we're transcoding into three formats, using one of the other two formats, I have a really hard time believing that that is not a good idea. This community is far too rooted in the free software. Fabrice doesn't understand that, that, that yes, it might work legally, it might work it technically, but if it doesn't go up to the, to the fairly high standards of the community, um, it just isn't going to happen. So I would have put this, even on the best of days, at a 20% pass rate, <laughs> because we, the way that, under fair use, we could use fair use priority fair use files a ton more than we do. Legally, under foundation mandate even, but our community has decided not to do that. Sorry, Jordan. Jonathan? Can I just ask, Jonathan. did we get um, the compromise? Because there was a, I haven't looked at the, the close of the RFC, but there was a compromise option of allowing importation of um, of videos and, and etc but they would then be stored in a in organ etc format where you'll be able to upload as mp4 and it will be converted on the fly did that pass the, the compromise options were rejected fairly robustly uh, Andrew and I are working on a secret plot to figure out a way that would allow people to at least uh, upload MP4s that would then later be uploaded to the Wikimedia Commons, which I really hope works out because open source video formats are not a plausible way forward. Well, you, I, you make it sound a lot more on, um, ominous than it actually is. <laughs> Our solution is fairly easy, and it's, it's not secret. It's, it is the Internet Archive is our friend, right? So the Internet Archive has no qualms with holding MP4 files or processing them or doing whatever. So one idea is, hey, if the Wikimedia community and commons thinks that MP4 is um, like a disease that cannot even, you know, touch our servers in the Wikimedia projects, then upload them to Internet Archive. They're happy to hold them. They'll transcode them to AUG and WebM, which are the two formats that Commons will take, and sideload them from Internet Archive in some way, and Bob's your uncle, right? So that might work. Um, the folks there that I've talked to are quite open to the idea. We haven't really gone much further than that, but that's, that's some hope there. Um, yeah, so that that's one possibility. But I think one of the things that kind of bothered me about the RFC, to answer Jonathan's question, was that people really got polarized on one end or the other. I think in the end it was two to one, the number of folks who just said absolutely not, um, versus the ones who said let's fully embrace MP4. And then there's actually probably only, what, a few dozen people in the middle 
that said, let's do partial MP4, because people really polarized themselves on both sides. So it was like something like 300 opposed, 150 support, and then like 20 or 30 right in the middle. So it pretty much came out to be an oppose all, to, all around on this one. Um, yeah, I, I think one of the thing that, things that did bother me was that you had people voting opposed not because of the merits of the case, but you saw a number of folks voting just basically like, we don't, do we really need video on Wikipedia? Or do we really want people uploading tons of raw video to edit? Nah, we don't want that. Which was really not the point of the whole RFC <laughs> to begin with. One of the things that I had been trying to convince Reese of for some time was that the appropriate place to hold the RFC would not actually be on Commons. Uh, it would be on a larger project such as MetaWiki mm -hmm. because the decision about whether to support MP4 uploads uh, is not a decision that is relevant only to Commons. It's relevant to every single media wiki pro or every single Wikimedia Foundation project. Uh, so I think that an RFC that made more clear that if we accept MP4 videos, they're going to be transcoded into free formats, and thus the freedom will be preserved. And if we accept MP4 videos, we're likely to multiply the number of videos we have by 10 or 100 or 1,000 in fairly short order. I think those are compelling points that were, by and large, looked over in the original RFC. Right. I mean, it was... I agree with Tom. I mean, he was more pessimistic than I was, and that's probably more realistic, which is that this topic is so big and, and fraught with so many weird aspects in terms of licensing and proprietary open source that it just something this complex just has a very little chance anyway of getting through the community, much less when it gets to, you know, a big corporation or a big clump of corporations like MPEG LA that no one really has any sympathy for. So oh well. Off to the next <laughs> attempt to solve this problem. In the meantime, you can't watch videos on an iPad or an iPhone coming from Wikipedia, which really frustrated the hell out of me when I was showing it uh, trying to show video just even like last week, I had a room full of like 15 friends of mine and no one had an Android handset and they couldn't watch any of the videos I wanted to show them that were in Wikipedia. I mean, it was like 15 people with an iPhone or an iPad but no Android handsets. And so that another, in that line, uh, I recently tried to upload or rather to watch a video with Windows 7 out of the box, the most recent updated version of IE. Uh, and found myself completely unable to watch any of our videos, and I think that's a problem. All right. Well, that with that that could be a whole hour episode just talking about this RFC because it was, this is one of the longest ones I've seen in a long time. Uh, yeah, that was pretty painful. Uh, so next topic. Uh, oh, a quick update on my class. I think since the last time we talked. I've actually started teaching this class um, at American University where we focus in on edit-a-thons. So just to recap for 10 seconds, this is a class I'm teaching for 15 weeks and five of those weeks are actually edit-a-thons that we're doing with different glam institutions here in Washington, D.C. So we're having our first one next week at the American Art Museum, the Smithsonian. Um, so students are really excited about that, and then two weeks after that, we're having an edit-a-thon at the National Archives, um, where Dominic McDevitt Parks is the Wikipedia in residence there, and then we are trying to arrange some Wiki some edit-a-thons with the Library of Congress and the museum. So now that we have this Wiki VIP thing, we might try to do something with NPR and maybe try to get those Wiki VIP voices from NPR into. Wikipedia in some way. So, Jonathan, since you're the glam guru, I'm open to any other ideas you might have, but but it's it's trying to be somewhat unconferency in this class so that the edit-a-thons in the second half of the semester are not really set, and I wanted to leave a little bit flexible in terms of getting the students to try different ways of engaging glam institutions. That's, that's a huge amount of, um, of time that they will have spent editing by, by the end of that. So, I would have hoped that you'd have a number of people in that class who would actually be um, happy to, to lead a table and to, to, to show other people how to edit. 
by the end of that, um, which might change the whole nature of, of what you're doing on there. One of the things that we found is that there are some organizations with uh, particularly ar archives and so on where they've got large reader lists where they're willing to, in, in, in some cases, send a an, an, um, an invitation to their um, their readers, the people with readership tickets, to come in and have some Wikipedia training. And there are there are groups like that where you can get some some interesting prospects coming in, in terms of, of recruiting editors. Um, there are other ways of, of of doing it where what we're trying to do is is to actually verify the articles and, and improve quality articles on there. But I I could talk about Glam for for hours and <laughs> uh, I, I can I can give you some specific. Um, I'm I'm sure that the people in that city can also give you some specific examples of where um, where it's worth talking to and 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 you'll learn from the sort of things that that your 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 the people in your class want to do and are ready to do um, as to how to stretch them next on there because um, I'm assuming you're stretching them a bit more each time. Well, that's a great that's a great idea. Actually, one of the things that's just kind of um, been happening for the last few days was a blog post by the kind of the head of digital for the Smithsonian about smaller museums and how you know glam efforts have kind of focused on the big guys and we really haven't done a lot with the smaller historical societies or smaller museums um, because they don't seem to get as many headlines or as many uh, uh, accolades as when you work with a large museum so maybe that's something we get students to do is work with small folks and start glam efforts there that, that's uh, um, that's another tactic you can take, particularly if you've got an interesting collection at that small museum. There's some there are some small museums around where they've got some really interesting stuff, and if they're open and willing to share it, so we've got a Wikipedia in residence um, at the York Museum's Trust at the moment, and they have a collection there of a, a gentleman called Tempest Anderson, who was a photographer in the early 20th century, who went off and just did glaciers and uh, um, and volcanoes that were blowing up and so on in the 1900s and there's this huge thing of glass slides that Tempest Anderson took around the world the first half dozen of them have been loaded up but the, the bulk of them are being cleaned up at the moment and will be um, we're expecting to have a whole bunch of them loaded up I think next uh, I think later this month um, and there's an editor thon going on in York in uh, about a month's time on there, so we've we can work we can work with, with um, certainly medium-sized museums. The other thing that we're we're doing with small museums is very often there's a a consortium that they have in an area. So we've got a training session going on in February. Um, one of our chaps is going down to Cornwall and running a training session where there's a lead museum. And they've invited a whole bunch of other museums in that county to come along, curators come along for a training session. Um, so I'm, um, I'm quite positive as to how, well, I'm, I'm quite hopeful as to how that's going to go. Great. Yeah, and if anyone has any uh, ideas for exercises for students on how to um, do something a little bit different than just editing articles. I'm open to it. Um, the Wiki Voices is a great one, or the Wiki VIP. Um, I'm going to get some students to try to shoot video to upload to Wikipedia. Um, we th we're thinking of make gamifying some of the uh, tasks in Wikipedia to see what they can do, or start a new Wiki project. So anything that any folks have in terms of ideas, feel free to contact me. Mm. Um, new wiki wiki projects don't really work that well from my memories of the pro public policy initiative back in the day because once the students leave there's nothing really there right I mean so a perfect perfect um, segue into another topic so one of my students one of the projects so what is it week four now of my class so I told them to at least find one wiki project you're interested in and try to engage mm -hmm. and most of them have found a pretty good one. One of my students was looking, because she had studied Central American art, she's from Panama, had written mm -hmm. a paper about it in Spanish, and found that there's absolutely nothing, there's no wiki project around Central American art. In fact, there's actually very little about any Central American artists that are of note. 
So she's going to start that because that's her passion. So hopefully there's some there's some hope of her sticking with that going forward. But um, that is one of the issues with uh, systemic bias in Wikipedia is that you know there's this whole this big gaping hole in terms of Central American art in Wikipedia. And I'm getting her to do a more detailed look at surveying what's there already. And even if there's not a wiki project. Um, and not a substantial number of articles. It's, it helps to even just try to do a, an inventory of what's there already. So, and once um, you create stubs on something, then you've got something that, are, that other people can build on and that will come up in Google searches. And there's a lot to be said for, for creating stubs in an area that, that we're weak on because a lot of people will, will add to an article that exists, particularly if it comes up in their Google searches, but they won't actually start a new one. There's, it's only a, about a quarter of our new editors who start by creating new articles. Um, and a lot of our, edi our editors, a huge amount of people out there, um, don't start new ones. Well, yeah, that, and that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, point. I've actually told my students to completely bypass articles for creation and just go in and start the articles. So. I think that's one of the things we learned from edit-a-thons for the last years. Just if you can at all avoid AFC, avoid it and don't even enter into that. Just go for it. What you can do with an edit-a-thon on there is, is encourage people to to start something up in their um, in a sandbox and then move it. Um, so th that is a slightly gentler approach than either AFC or or um, Going straight into the to main space. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, good. Let's see. The other topic that we had related to this was um, this. Uh, what was it? Oh yeah. So there's an interesting article about which news sources Wikipedia cites the most. So I don't know if you folks have seen this. I'll try to bring it up on the screen here. This was kind of cool. This is done out of the Tau Center for digital journalism at Columbia University J School, which where I used to teach a long time ago. And this is pretty cool. It was it was done January 17th by this guy named Fergus Pitt. And he basically looked at the top ten stories of 2013. Um, or and and he looked at about 30 Wikipedia pages that referred to the top ten news stories of 2013 and then tried to find out which news sources were cited the most by Wikipedia. Let me see if I can bring this up so we can take a look at it. And I don't think this, the results are that surprising, but it is kind of cool that someone systematically went through there and tried to find that information. Actually, so. there was something surprising about this. Which oh, yeah, you, that? Can you scroll down to it? just the overall pie chart? Overall pie chart. This one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the long tail surprised me. Mm -hmm. That... Th Basically, 10% is only the New York Times. I thought between those major sources, the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, Guardian, Reuters, BBC, HuffPost, NBC, New York, New Republic, USA Today, mm -hmm. and even if you would like throw in Fox News and a bunch of others, you still have a majority of our sources from other people that are in the site Just news good. template, I guess. Mm-hmm. So that's good news, I would think, right? Yeah. Mm. I can tell you one of the places where that comes from. Um, one of the projects I've been involved in, where I have started, is the the Death Anomalies project, where um, we get a list every day of people who are alive according to the English Wikipedia and dead according to um, some other language Wikipedia. And most of the time, the, the sort of the classic thing is the. Um, the, the Finnish Olympic skier who got a gold medal in the 1950s and now uh, sadly has, has passed away and a Finnish publication will cover that. Um, it, very often the, the, the sources that, that we're getting those obituaries and so on from are not ones that would appear in that top ten there. It's part of the long tail. So you need to have, well, it, certainly, it certainly helps to have something that's one of those major sources to establish credibility, to get that thing started and so on. But a lot of the other information that's going to be coming in may come from from, from other sources. They actually, they actually give us the raw data. Translated. This is cool. 
they um so the creator of this actually releases the raw data to us um so under the 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 pie chart it says you can also examine the full data set and then it bumps you over to a google doc which gives you the exact counts in order so nice. over 50 citations is only 15 um there's only 15 sources, mm -hmm. which is pretty interesting. Yeah, and it's cool that he even gives out the Python script that he uses and says, hey, mm -hmm. download this and run it on your own sets of articles, which is kind of cool. Yeah, so this, this is... Open source cool. software at work. Yeah, open source software, that's great. It's in GitHub, you can go down there. So this is pretty cool because you can imagine for articles about American topics like Zimmerman or Boston Marathon bombings, you see Boston Globe, CNN, New York Times, or CNN, or Nine Sentinel for George Zimmerman because that was down in Florida. That's kind of expected. Um, and, but the other ones are kind of cool, like Syrian Civil War because it's international. Reuters is the number one news source, New York Times, then BBC. Um, but then like Egyptian Coup, um, a very different set of uh, news sources, right? So Aram Online, Al Jazeera, BBC, um, and then Pope Francis, National Catholic Reporter, is the number one news source there for Pope Francis. It's um, a pretty good source. Mm -hmm. I, I've used it before my writing about nuns that get themselves, that protest and end up getting arrested. I've used that source quite a few times. Yeah, and then uh, for Pope Francis, BBC and then La Nación before you got to New York Times or Reuters. So that was kind of interesting to see that. So is St. Louis Fed the Federal Reserve? I don't know. Isn't that interesting? U.S. economy, St. Louis Fed is the number one source cited. I don't know anything about St. Louis Fed. My first inclination without actually having looking at the been looking at the article would be that they would be citing direct statistics from the Fed, uh, mm -hmm. which St. Louis doesn't put it quite in the same group as news sources. Right. Saint, there is a Federal Reserve Bank in St. Louis, and the Twitter handle of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis is St. Louis Fed. So, let's go with that. Yeah, they must be, do a lot of stats that are interesting to Wikipedia to cite, it seems. Yeah, interesting. So that's a cool little project, um, and very detailed there. And they even have the whole methodology and, as you said, the, the, the data set as well. So, yeah, it merits some more uh, investigation. I, was, I looked at the Python script. It was pretty easy to customize, so I might be trying some of that sooner than later. Cool. Um, other topic here is uh, a cool mapping project. I want to show this one. This is kind of neat. This was uh, sent to us from uh, a viewer of the podcast, which is... Uh, a, a nice little project that allows you to, um, you know, type in a category and then it finds the geodata for all the stuff in that category and plots it on a map, and then you can click through and browse, which is kind of cool. So, for example, I think the one I did was um, former tallest, no, what was it? I can't remember what the category was. It was a list of former previous tallest buildings of the world, or how about lowest... Lowest points in the world, like that, and it pulses. It finds all the articles, and then these are all the places that are mentioned or categorized as lowest points in the world. Now, I don't know why there's more than one, because if you're the lowest, you're the lowest, or maybe lowest points in these respective areas. So you can actually click on this and show Cairo, Illinois. Is Cairo, Illinois, the lowest point for some reason? I don't know. It, yeah. Uh, the Cairo, Illinois, is where the um, where the Ohio and the Mississippi meet. Ah. So that shouldn't make sense. I don't know. <laughs> it can't. That can't be below sea level. It really can't be below sea level. You wouldn't think so. It could be the lowest point in a state or something. I don't know what that would be. But it's a pretty cool way to browse stuff. Um, so I thought that was worth mentioning. And it's by, uh, yeah, and the map is here. It's an Esri map here, so that's pretty cool. 
Uh, let's see, the other thing that I want to make sure we talked about, since we have Jonathan on here, Jonathan, I think you and I met first in Poland? Is that right? Mm. I think uh, no, 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 Buenos Aires. Is that right? We met in Buenos Aires yeah. first? Okay, that's right. That's true. So we met in Buenos Aires first, and one of the cool things that Jonathan does, which, which I think has been a huge value to the community, is um, keeping this really awesome chart on RFAs, or request for adminship. And it really was quite astonishing. I remember when you showed me this thing in Poland, maybe that's what it was, is I remembered mostly when you showed it to me and said, oh, by the way, look at how much we've dropped in terms of admins getting promoted in Wikipedia. So if you take a look at this thing that is in his user page called RFA by month, it is a really startling graph. And I think we've shown it on this podcast in previous episodes in a different context. But if you look at this, um, it is a very you know, uh, eye-opening chart in terms of September 2012 as really being the depths of our despair <laughs> in terms of <laughs> adminship in Wikipedia, having no admins in that one month in English Wikipedia. So that maybe it was a wake-up call because ever since then we've at least had one per month and some months we had five and Kevin was part of the three that were promoted in January 2014. So so I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about um, what was your motivation for it and and how do you do this and, and what, have, what what do we learn from this, this graphic that you maintain? I've been doing this since, I think, about 2009. Um, and when I first started doing it, there was there were a lot of discussion going on as to whether we were in a drought at, uh, for new admins and whether this was some cyclical thing or we had actually seen a real change in, in, in admission. Um, and it became very clear fairly quickly after I started doing this that there was this dramatic change in the spring of 2008 and that if you look at the, the column below the graph, sorry, the, the row below the graph, mm -hmm. total promoted, on there. You'll see that um, 2000 2007 we had 408 um, new admins which is the, the highest we've ever had in a year. Um, it dropped to half that in, in 2009 and all the subsequent years until last year mm -hmm. it dropped by about a third on the previous year. So by, by the, the worst year of the sort of modern era, actually the worst year ever recorded, um, it was 2012 mm -hmm. when we just had 28 new admins and a couple of us who were sort of following this and speculating with, with saying we'll be lucky if we get 20 in 2013 if it follows that, that pattern of declining by a third. And Instead, 2013, we actually got 34 new admins. We got six more new ones than the year before. That's still not replacement level, um, but we do seem to have well, hit, hit bottom, if nothing else, on there, because the last two, two and a half years, we've been bouncing around at between zero and six admins, typically about three in each month. And I, I don't think there was anything particularly wrong in September um, 2012 so much as it's, uh, um, it's statistical noise, it's fluctuate, random fluctuations between naught and half a dozen in any one month um, at the moment. It goes up a bit if we have a, um, an article in Signpost, who knows, it may go up a bit um, having the article, having it discussed in, in, in this, um, because the the issue we've we've got on there is that the community is changing. Um, the, at the peak, we had over a thousand active admins. Um, that's dropped now by well over a third. Um, and three a month is not replacement level. Mm -hmm. So we don't know how many admins we actually need, um, partly because 
it's it's like herding lolcats. Um, <laughs> you've got some admins who are active under our measure of things, who are putting in an hour, giving us an hour or so of admin time every couple of months. Um, and you've got other admins who are doing an awful lot more than that. Um, it's not like employing people where you can turn around and say, um, to continually man this 24-7, you need five five people employed or something. Um, you, 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 you can't do that. You have to say, well, we, we know that with the scale of what's happening on Wikipedia with the attack pages, vandalism and so on that's going on, we pretty much need to have admins around all the time, but we don't know how many volunteers it takes, giving a fair amount of time, to give us that continual coverage purely based on when people randomly log on. Um, so it's it's an interesting thing in terms of what's the minimum we need to handle. For me, I'm one of the people who believes that that. I like the idea of having the community as a self-governing, self-organizing community where all the long-term, regular, um, sensible members of the community were admins or could be if they wanted to be. And what we've now got is this situation where, going back to that, that chart, we're still dependent. And I've got some figures I started updating. I haven't finished it yet. But where it's fairly clear, even just from when people were appointed, that if we've got over 600 active admins, and we've only appointed 100 in the last three years, 200 in the two previous years, um, about 500 in the in the last six years, um, when we've got over 600 admins, well, we've actually got a very large proportion of those who've been admins for longer than six years. The majority of the admins we've ever appointed um, were appointed um, in that those those peak years of 2005, 6, 7, 8, um, that era, and 2005, 6, and 7. And that's creating this wiki generation gulf, um, which I th think I'm seeing tension emerging between some of the people who started editing in the last two, three years, when people who start editing around the same time, people who've got similar sorts of level experience, are not admins. And they're seeing these admins who've been around for years, who in some cases are much less active now than, than some of these new era editors. Um, and they've got the admin bit because in 2005, with three months' experience and a thousand edits, they sailed through RFA <laughs> and are now still admins to this to this day. I think there is a little bit of well, and I've noticed a bit of tension emerging, and I predicted it a couple of years ago, and um, I can see that continuing. Well, that's it's interesting because that, that it, you're right. I mean, I'm one of those those yokels in 2003 that had like a thousand edits and four months of experience, five, no, five months experience, and I, I would never be able to make admin today um, with those credentials, or even my current credentials, I don't think. Um, but that has some parallels, weirdly enough, with the fact that I don't know, I guess I guess we talked about this in the previous podcast, that you know the executive director search for the Wikimedia Foundation um, has to be reset because they couldn't find a candidate. I think they're, they're related in some weird way, right? Like, basically, we talked about how the Sue Gardner of 2007 could never get today's executive director job. So the same kind of thing happens with all these admins that were made admin 2003, 2005. You know, they're not, they would never pass today's standard for adminship. And Kevin, you just passed adminship and just kind of by just eyeballing it, it seemed like the, the process was not as violent and objectionable as I remember it. It doesn't seem like you were peppered with lots of hypothetical scenarios and to explain at length what you would do in this convoluted copyright uh, situation and if you get the answer wrong I'm gonna vote against you with extreme pre prejudice. So I'm wondering Jonathan, Kevin, even Tom, like, is that just my gut feeling or is there something to be said for the fact that Kevin got through, I don't want to say in 
easier than in years past, but it seemed like it was a little bit more reasonable than I expected. It's okay, you can say easier than in years past. <laughs> I didn't see anybody that was out for blood in Kevin's RFA. I it was a little bit in mine in two thousand ten, I think. Um, no, I was a two thousand eleven. But there, but definitely people were out for it. List every article you've ever created. I think was one of my RFA questions. So people were definitely m- more more into pinning you against the wall mm-hmm. than. I think today, partly because I think we're seeing this decrease in admins, and this, and it doesn't make sense to the younger editors. So why, why is it that nobody gets anything fun? <laughs> I do have to wonder what degree, uh, what contribution my efforts dealing with Wikipr had to do with my adminship. Definitely a lot of my support votes explicitly mentioned uh, things like sock puppets or even things like Wikipr explicitly. <laughs> and I wonder if I had not gotten involved in that kerfuffle, if the previous kerfuffles that I had been involved in would have been brought up in a much more substantial way. I haven't nominated anyone for a while now, but... I, I still keep there's there's sort of in my mind there's there's my criteria as to what I would look for before I would support someone, but I've also I, I sort of keep an eye of what the criteria is that I I think will get somebody through comfortably, past um, as as acceptable to the community, and I don't think that's enormously tightened in the last few years, the last three or four years. Um, what has changed um, has been that we don't have, we very rarely see diffs appearing in RFAs now. The focus is very much on certain statistics mm-hmm. um, and the Q&A section. Um, if somebody does come up with um, with a diff showing that, that there is certain misbehavior, certain types of misbehavior that's relatively recent, then that um, that can still crash an RFA, um, but I'm not convinced we've got as many people actually looking through people's edits as we once used to have. That's, to my mind, that's actually not a not a particularly good thing because it could mean that people are getting through RFA who we wouldn't actually necessarily want to get through RFA if we knew some of the things they'd done in the last 12 months, um, and it does mean that. Uh, there's, to some reassuring extent, that there are these particular statistics that people look at in terms of your edit count, um, how long you've, um, your tenure, how many months you've been around, um, and how many, how long you've been around since you last had a block, um, and whether you've got um, a, at least some content creation, which was the big change that happened in early 2008 after rollback was unbundled. It no longer became possible to, to make admin purely as a good Fandal fighter, and that was the big drop then. Um, ever since early 2008, you've got to show some content contributions, and it's very rare to get somebody past that RFA unless they can show that they've they've added reference material. Right. Which I I don't see it's a problem. I think that's a good thing, but. It's part of the change that's happened. I would definitely agree with you that there are fewer people looking for diffs to oppose people based on, uh, just because if somebody had done a comprehensive search of my edit editing career, they would have been able to find a lot of diffs where I still think that I was in the right, but it would have at least added, added significant controversy to my RFA. And I think that if my RFA had been occurring just a couple years earlier, the diffs that people would have dug up uh, would have been significantly likely to derail the entire process. Uh, versus now, where I think I had one person post a diff, and then two other people comment on that diff saying, I don't really see why this is an issue. 
And also, I would suspect that two years ago, somebody who had less than 9,000 total edits with probably less than 3,000 or 4,000 main space edits, uh, I would be surprised if that had gone under the radar and been accepted. Well, oh, interestingly, um, in 2011, when I passed my RFA, I had 8,326 edits, and my main space and my art main space edits were 27% of my 27% uh, of the pie at 2,135 edits. So I I am in that under that amount. My um mine my RFA was almost um killed by the fact that. I didn't. Uh, I opposed the del the deletion of. Um, if you remember WQA Wiki Quit Alerts, however you pronounce it, there was a redirect for for it from Rundamami, which I opposed the deletion of, and people got very unhappy about. So you your. Um RFA was fifty nine fourteen six. Yes, which is which is a pretty close, but not. I mean, it's still significantly you know in the majority that you passed. Interesting. I also find that comparing our, our like our RFA side by side, uh, I got a total of ten questions, and most of them were either very standard questions. Uh, or questions that had one obvious right answer, where, for instance, for your own question, if I had said that I had intended to uh, participate in undisclosed paid editing while being an admin, I, pr I, I expect that would have been a bad thing. Uh, so I also think that besides for the general decrease in number of questions, there's been a general decrease in number of trick questions. I feel like a lot of older RFAs had questions that were designed where if you didn't phrase your answer absolutely appropriately, you would run into problems. And I the, certainly uh, didn't really get any of those. One of the most famous of those, actually it appeared in my RFA, um, was the whole, would, are you going to be open to recall if you, were, if you're, if you become Ooh. an admin? Because there is no good answer to that. Because if you say yes, well, recall isn't binding. I don't like recall, therefore I oppose you. If you say no, well, you're not going to be open to the community, therefore I oppose you. <laughs> I think I managed to finesse that one in mind back in 2009. But luckily that, that sort of um, catch-22 type thing has, has decreased somewhat. We do occasionally get people who are asking questions where and opposing where basically if you um, if you edit according to a particular policy that they disagree with they will oppose your RFA. Um, I don't think we've got a situation where that can stink an RFA but you might wind up with with one or two editors opposing over particular right. on there. Yeah I mean I think there's there's a lot less purity test questions on the RFA and I think I don't know if it's just my perception of Kevin's RFA, but um, it seemed like there was a lot more emphasis than what I remember on why do you need these tools, and your justification for why you need the tools could really set the tone in a way that makes or breaks your RFA. So for you, Kevin, it helped that you were going to be the Wikipedian in residence at UC Berkeley. I think that just kind of helped set the tone in a certain way. I don't know if that we felt that too. I felt that to some extent, except it's also definitely interesting that uh, admins or RFAs who are looking for the tools, who are looking for the tools primarily for one specific purpose, have historically been greatly, greatly frowned on. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look on my additional questions, besides for the absolute typical ones, uh, one of mine is, have you ever edited Wikipedia from another username? which is both a fair question and not really a trick question. Then I had one question uh, related to my Wikipedia and residence activities. Uh, I had one question related to basically WP colon involved. 
Uh, I had one question. I hate that this keeps coming up, but one question related to deaths during consensual sex uh, <laughs> that nobody ended up commenting about in any of the voting. Uh, then I had some uh, one question about BLP, one question about what do you consider the role of an administrator to be, and one question consider but by. by Tom asking if I have edited for pay without directly closing it to the community. And if you compare those to the questions that Tom got asked, there's a pretty significant difference. Some of it does vary by candidate. So we, we had another RFA recently, which I won't mention, but um, I won't name the, 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 the candidate. but. A few years ago, they'd had some involvement as a volunteer with the Wikimedia Foundation and supported the Wikimedia Foundation, one of its um, uh, one of its schemes, etc. Um, and they were getting opposes for that, even though they they were now saying they regretted and apologised for back, which did strike me as being, along with the RFC we were talking about earlier on, an indication of how um, the the, the Wikimedia Foundation doesn't have as high a reputation within the community as perhaps it should have, or perhaps it would want to have. In and going to my, in going to my RFA, in going to my RFA, I was definitely expecting questions about my involvement with the Wikimedia Foundation to come up. Just because I've previously interned there as a communications person, and on top of that, I've done about eight months of contract work with them about their grant program. And I was actually fairly significantly surprised that no one mentioned the fact that I've previously been by the Wikimedia Foundation during my RFA. So maybe it was specific because there are certain programs the foundation's done that have been contentious and this was somebody who'd been involved in one of those contentious ones. Um, the, yeah, that, that's, um, yeah, there, 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 is a, there are odd, some odd patterns that emerge on that. One of the things I've noticed is that people will either, either go through uncontentiously at, at very close to 100%. Um, a significant proportion of the people going through are, are, are doing that. And then there, there are some where it's it's more of a of a battle, um, but the, it's not as if it's so difficult that people are only just scraping through now. We still have this significant pro of proportion of the people who are getting through RFA are getting through at very close to 100 percent, which to my mind means that there's probably a lot of people out there, all, but all of those people could probably have done it a year earlier. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm I'm glad we got you on, Jonathan, because I've always wanted to dig deeper into that graph that you maintain, and I'm really happy that we could talk about it. And I mean, just looking at the 2005 October number, where there were 67 successful candidates that made it through, I, I can't even. I was there during that time. I just can't even imagine what that's like to have two people per day being promoted to admin. It's just fascinating to me. 68 uh, in December. Yeah. I'm not. I'm, I wasn't around then. Um, so I'm I'm not sure of, of some of these spikes. One of the spikes, I think, the one in um, in November, the third highest spike, which was in November two thousand and seven. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Somebody did want to say that there was um, some there was some reason why they thought they were about to lead, need a lot more admin, some new scheme coming in or something, and there was a there was a particular drive to find candidates and. And a point at admins that month. There is this big spike then, but the last the last quarter of um, of two thousand and five has two of the highest months ever um, at RFA, and more um, more new admins in that quarter than in the last um, almost the last four years. Fairly close to that. The, the the last um, fifteen quarters combined, I think, um, it's it's a big contrast. But 
in that era, people were becoming admins in order to get rollback. And one of the things mm -hmm. that, that we should console ourselves with is that there have been various unbundlings that have taken place. And some of those um, have, have just reduced the, the need for RFA. So a lot of people who, who wanted rollback in order to, um, uh, to combat vandalism more effectively, um, well, they can get rollback now very easily, and we've got a lot of rollbackers. That's a great point. If you don't need blocking or locking, then maybe the rollback tools are just fine for you, and you can do it that way. Well, there's a new template tool, too. Yeah, that came in partly because of one particular RFA where somebody wanted to edit templates. Um, and oh, somebody, one of you mentioned the, the idea of people who, who only want to use the tools for one particular thing tend to fail. It's a, it's a really bizarre pattern. And when I've, when I've put candidates up in the past, I've advised them that the, the answer that the community likes to hear is, I feel I'm qualified to use the tools in these one or two areas from my experience doing this and another. And I'll move into other areas as, as and when I feel comfortable and I'll do it cautiously and responsibly, etc. What people don't want to hear is, I feel confident using the tools in this particular area. I'm only going to use the tools in that particular area. I, I really don't enormously see the difference between the two. I don't understand why somebody would, would support on the basis of one statement and oppose on the basis of another, unless you actually thought this, I, this person might be able to use the tools here, but there's something else they're doing which shows that they would be completely unsuitable to have, to have the whole set of tools. But that is, it's one of the quirks of the of the RFA crowd. Um, so if you feel that you're qualified for adminship and you fancy getting it, even if you're only planning to ev only ever use, say, the block tool or, or the deletion tool, um, just don't admit that that's what you're planning. Say you're confident of doing this and you won't move on to other things until you're very cautious, very confident about them. Well, thanks for that. That's we're, we've really gotten to the weeds of RFA, but hey, you know that's that's a uh, fascinating. We're we're all admins here, right? So all four of us. So uh, interesting yeah. in all different eras in terms of when we got into the adminship. <laughs> uh, so the last thing we are going to take a look at are the popular articles for the past week, which should be no surprise. This is like a huge week in pop culture. So if you look at the top articles that. Um, we see in the access logs, it is basically everything related to Grammys, to, um, I don't even know, more than Grammys here. It's um, everything from Daft Punk to Lord to Pete Seeger passing away. Oh, no. um, sad, 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 yeah. sad, sad. So. I, I was, I'm in the middle of writing his discography, too, so it was really saddening to hear that I was hoping one day to ask him what do you consider part of your discography but so you're working on it before you passed away it won't happen yeah. yeah I've been working on it for over a year now wow there's over there's over a hundred he's released over a hundred releases in 50 years wow that's amazing uh, I think the Grateful Dead's the only people that have released more. Wow. I hate uh, to use this particular movement or moment to lead, but unfortunately I do really need to head out. So I shall see all of you during the next Wikipedia Weekly episode. Okay, thanks. Okay. See you. Um, just a few more Bye. things here. Um, Amanda Knox was back in the news again. Ah. Yes. I'm sure in the UK that's been a big thing. Uh, let's see. Wolf of Wall Street. Lizzie Borden. I don't know why Lizzie Borden's in there. Is there some kind of new movie about her that's coming up? I think that's the case. Was she Google Doodle, maybe? Uh, looks like nice. there is a, a movie called Lizzie coming up. Where Christina uh, Ricci is starring, so that might be the reason why it's gotten more press recently. And then um, Harriet Tubman, it is Black History Month, 
that might be the reason for that. Justin Bieber, <laughs> not that he needed to be arrested and possibly deported to be up here, but he is kind of always up in the top. Um, Frozen, which is still doing miraculously at the box office. Is that right? I haven't seen it, but I'm told that it's pretty good. Wow, look at this. It's got a take of $870 million for that movie. So that's pretty astonishing. IPv6, for some reason. Not exactly sure why. And there might be a big switch over in one country. Could be. True Detectives. Julian Mott. From Chelsea to Man U. Two huge records. Two, I mean, two huge clubs for... 37.1 million pounds. <laughs> wow. It is the it's the transfer window and I I know nothing about sport, but I do know that it's the, <laughs> the transfer window in the the English um, Premier League um, was during January. So I think they had they had to transfer um, they could they could only do it mid season during during the month of January or something like that, so they had to do the thing by the end of that month. So there were a num there will have been a number of news stories about transfers. That seemed like an awful lot of money, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all right. So uh, that is our episode for Wikipedia Weekly. If you need to get in touch with us, you can go to Wikipedia. The shortcut WP colon WWPC gets you to the page for the Wiki Wikipedia Weekly podcast. You can also go to Facebook and find our Wikipedia Weekly page there. Uh, feel free to contact us, and if you're interested in joining in or suggesting topics, feel free to go to that page and, and uh, join in the conversation. So thanks a lot, Jonathan. Thanks a lot, Tom, um, for hanging in there. I know it's a crazy <laughs> hour in the UK, isn't it, Jonathan? So thanks for staying up late or early, as it might be. And uh, we'll see you next time on Wikipedia Weekly. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye. Good night. Good night.